Hey, listeners, it's Dan here. I want to tell you about a company that I'm really excited about. It's called Current. It's a fintech company that's completely disrupting traditional banking. I'm a new Current customer. It's already helping me and my entire family manage our finances, all from one easy-to-use app. So try Current for yourself and get the app by going to current.com slash OK. That's current.com slash OK. Current is a financial technology company, not a bank. Banking services provided by and Visa debit card issued by Choice Financial Group, member FDIC, pursuant to a license from Visa USA Inc. and can be used everywhere Visa debit cards are accepted. Okay, welcome to OK Computer. I am Dan Nathan. I am joined with Jeff Richards, managing partner at GGV Capital. Jeff, welcome back to OK Computer. Thanks for having me. All right, it's been a little bit. You and I talked, I think, the last week of August. There was plenty to talk about. The markets, in at least on the public side, had just had this huge rip over two months over the course of the summer into mid-August. And the NASDAQ, and there was many names in the NASDAQ, I think, you know, was up nearly 20%. But there were stocks up 50 60 70%. I know that you and I spent um, some time talking about that. Over the course of this past year, you and I have talked about the lag effect from what goes on in public markets into private markets. We definitely want to update that. And I think, you know, you and I are both a, a little bit, uh, I, I don't know, left um, very quizzical about this Elon Musk takeover of Twitter and what it means, not only just for Twitter, what it means for Tesla, what it means for the man who's now the CEO of three really important companies, right? And what it could mean for technology MA going forward. So let's hit all of that. Let's start with public tech earnings. Here we are. We're on the other side. I think, you know, we're, we're, we're close to done of Q3 earnings. And last week was pretty fascinating. When you think about, you know, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, Microsoft, Meta, all reporting, four of them had massive one-day declines, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars in market cap. Apple had this very quizzical huge rally, 7% on a 2.3 or $2.4 trillion market cap, but it's given a lot of that back over the last couple of days. What was your general takeaway from Q3 results, Q4 guidance, and I guess investors' reaction to that? Well, I think, first of all, we got to put it in perspective. I mean, AWS is, if you look at Amazon's earnings in particular, the thing that caught me is AWS is a $80 billion run rate business growing at north of 30% a year. I mean, AWS, they own about 40% of the cloud infrastructure market. Microsoft is about 20%. You know, I was chatting with one of our LPs last week. Guess what AWS revenue was in 2010? So just 12 years ago. It was not the dark ages. This is not like- No, it was, it, was probably, it was probably under $10 billion annually. It was 500 million. Yeah, yeah. Under a billion. So, okay, there you go. So, I mean, just think about the, we, we sort of take it for granted, the exponential growth of cloud computing and mobile and all these things that are around us. But, you know, when you're adding, when you're growing an $80 billion business at 30% a year, you're adding $20 billion of revenue. I mean, there, there are only a handful of software companies in the world that are over $20 billion of revenue. So I, I think the scale of these businesses is quite astonishing. Uh, and I think, you know, personally, as you know, I'm I'm very bullish on cloud. I think folks are underestimating the value of 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 AWS and Azure in particular in the long run. TBD, whether Google and and GCP sort of plays a stronger hand and catches up. But then Apple, you know, I I think you have the same point of view I do. I just think Apple's in a very unique position. I mean, they control distribution. You've seen what they've done to Facebook and Snap with IDFA and you know, then you look at the way that they have financially managed the business in terms of buybacks, dividends, et cetera. It's pretty astonishing. I mean, has there been a better people knock Tim Cook for not being the most creative person on the planet? But look at the financial performance of that company over the last decade. It's pretty astonishing. And I think, you know, that is a safe haven, right? You want to you want a safe haven, you put your money in T-bills or muni bonds or Apple stock. And I think you see that over, over on the earnings over the last week or two. A couple of quick takeaways from, from your comments here. So, you know, that AWS business, and you mentioned Google Cloud, Azure. I mean, one of the big reasons why I think those stocks got hit was the deceleration that we saw in the quarter, right? And I think you and I, you know, you can put that $80 billion growing at, at 30% a year. The funny thing about Amazon is, is like, do the math on that. That is the entire valuation of Amazon's 
stock. So talk to me a little bit about some of the parts for Amazon, okay, when you think about the retail <laughs> business, which is being valued at nothing, okay? And Basically so, zero. I guess, and, 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 you know, and you and I have gone back and forth over the course of this year debating what sort of recession we're going to have, when it hits, how deep, how long, that sort of thing. And again, we're starting to see a slowdown in enterprise. I think that was kind of one of the kickers that one of the reasons why I guess we saw that crescendo in September in the markets in general, because I think some investors were kind of, okay, it's finally here. We're starting to see that as far as in the Q3 uh, numbers and the Q4 guidance. Well, we've had that, right? So if you see unemployment start to tick up, we're going to see these these public cloud revenue growth decelerate a bit, right? Are we going to agree on that? So talk to me about the some of the parts in Amazon. And just so you know, full disclosure, I mean, I started buying this stock for the first time in a very long time below 100 over the last week. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you're not alone. Yeah. Well, I, I feel lucky in that my cost basis in Amazon is... Uh, <laughs> It's a lot lower than where it is today. So, look, I, I think it's an incredibly well-run company. I think I, I was reading a post somewhere where somebody actually said, look, Amazon is about, and maybe it was Chamath on the All In podcast, started to talk about how Amazon may go into a mode similar to Apple. Andy Jassy is sort of signaling that they will do, they will run the business in a way that's a little bit closer to the way that Apple does. And he was sort of contrasting it with what Zuckerberg is doing at Facebook, where he's obviously investing tens of billions of dollars in, in VR. But I think, you know, you're one, you're right. Um, cloud infrastructure is a consumption based business. We see that with companies like Snowflake as well. If large enterprise consumption slows down over the next 12 months because we go into some type of recessionary environment and maybe we're already in it, then you should see the, the growth rates decline. I guess the only thing is if you're a long term investor, nobody can move off of the cloud. It's not like they're going to go from the cloud to something else. And so over the long run, it's about as safe a bet as you can have, in my opinion, in terms of tech um, over the long run. Now, valuations and multiples can go up and down, but I don't think you know consumption of cloud infrastructure five years from now is not going to be lower than it is today. So that's a fairly safe bet. And to some degree, it's sort of like buying, you know, T-Mobile or AT&T or, you know, the wireless infrastructure stocks a decade ago when it was very clear that wireless was was going to be, you know, and, and smartphones were going to be the dominant way that we all use computing and communication. So you're making a very safe bet. I think the question is, do they move into a mode where they do more buybacks, they do dividends, they become more of a stable, reliable platform that you can invest in, that anybody can invest in like Apple. Clearly, Facebook and Snap are not in that category. They're investing. They're not, they, they, well, I guess Facebook did do buybacks, unfortunately, at a very high price compared to where the stock trades today. But I just, I just, I, I think, you know, you're, you're not alone. I had several folks tell me they were buying Amazon at 100 and slightly below it. It just seems like a no brainer. Yeah, I, I think your point is a great one about Tim Cook. And when you think about what he's presided over over the last 10 years since Steve Jobs passing, I mean, they've returned over, I think, $600 billion um, to shareholders during that time period. And so it's but basically a floor on the stock versus, you know, in very difficult periods. The stock has had plenty of 30, 40 percent peak to trough declines in that period. I think three, four or five or so. But look at the market. Just look at this market over 2022. The stock's down 15 or so percent versus a NASDAQ that's down 30 percent. And we know that they're buying back, you know, tens of billions of dollars of stock. So I also like, the, you know, this kind of analogy. Look at Satya. So Tim Cook, you know, Satya, Sundar, these these kind of second acts. I mean, they've been tremendous. So there's no reason to think that Andrew Jazzy shouldn't be uh, able to do the second. You know, you mentioned with Apple and, and you know, this relative strength here, you talk about the means of, of distribution controlling that. That's the one thing that I just got to say, man, if we're thinking about regulatory, you know, action against these companies, you got to think that, you know, Apple's antennas are up as high as they've ever been. And we know that this has been a pillar of the bear case for all the mega cap tech. But what they did to some of these massive competitors over the last year, year and a half with ATT, you got to think something's coming their way. Well, it's funny. I, I saw this morning uh, the FTC just blocked a merger of two book companies. I think it was uh, Simon and Schuster, and another one. It was a two billion dollar deal. <laughs> when you look at the stranglehold that Apple has on distribution, it, it at some point you have to believe in the future that we won't have just Apple and Google controlling essentially distribution for all applications which means really everything, right? It's search, it's the way we consume content, it's the way we communicate with each other. 
I don't know. I, I think that I think you're right. And I just don't know at what point does the government take a serious look at it. Uh, but it feels like at some point they will. And then the question, you know, it's like when they talk about breaking up Amazon um, and people say, well, gosh, if you broke up the Amazon, you'd unlock a ton of value. It's like when eBay released PayPal from from inside its infrastructure. So you you almost wonder what I mean, first of all, that would take a very long time. Yeah. But second of all, the sum of the parts of those businesses could be extremely attractive. I mean, how much is YouTube worth if you spun that out? Or Android, if you spun that out. So, um, I just, you know, we're in a we're in a we're in a crazy time. This year has been a, a crazy year for individual investors, for public investors. I mean, I'm an investor in three hedge funds. Over the last year, all of them were down about fifty percent. I mean, these are some of the smartest people in the world who are spending their day trying to figure out what's what to be long and what to be short, and they're just getting crushed. You know, and then you look at obviously folks like Janet Yellen and you know, Powell, I mean, I, I, it just feels like we're in a very interesting era where folks really don't know how to understand the tea leaves of what, you know, we have record low unemployment, we're spiking rates to, to drive down inflation. We're not seeing unemployment go up. I have a theory as to why that is, but it's just a really interesting time. And it's a very hard time for individual investors. That is the missing piece of the puzzle. I think some of the smartest economists, strategists, we can all agree that we were going to have some sort of mean reversion as far as inflationary readings and commodities and you know services and some of these other areas. But wages is the stickiest thing here. And so when you think about how quickly rates have come up, we've yet to really feel that hit the economy. And I think that's one of the reasons why people explained away the technical definition of uh, a recession that we had with two negative consecutive quarters of GDP earlier this year. And they really think that the, the proper economic recession that's going to happen when unemployment goes up, which is, again, the last piece of the puzzle, happens next year. So I'm curious, what is your view of that? Because it hasn't happened yet. We have this October jobs data that's coming Friday morning. We know that a lot of investors have closely watched this because if it does start to tick up, it actually gives the Fed some cover to possibly take their foot off the Fed, you know, the, the rate hiking um, schedule at which they've been under, which is going to be supposedly four consecutive 75 basis point hikes when we have this meeting uh, result on Wednesday afternoon. Well, my theory is pretty simple. Um, Fifty-five percent of Americans work for a small business. Small businesses are 42 percent of U.S. GDP. You've heard me talk about this before. And small business, first of all, a lot of them went out of business in 2020 due to COVID. They had to literally shut their doors. They weren't allowed to operate. They bounced back, and we saw five million new business applications in that time window. So a lot of folks left the workforce and then went and started a small business. So you had a set of small businesses that went out of business, the ones that survived got stronger. And then with inflation, two things happened. One, they couldn't hire enough workers. So they had staffing shortages. And instead of having their bar open till midnight, they had to close it at 10. Or if they were a restaurant, they stopped serving food at eight instead of 10. So they had a staffing shortage, but inflation actually increased their profit margins because the cost of goods rose slightly, but it also enabled them to raise price in their restaurants and for the various services that they they sell to consumers. So you talk to any, not any, but most restaurant owners will tell you they're making more money than they've ever made right now. They still have a labor shortage and they're still trying to hire. So as long as you have the businesses that employ 55% of the workforce still trying to catch up to what would be a normalized staffing level, I just think you're gonna, it's going to be hard to see unemployment go up. If I'm a small business that normally employs 10 people and I've been running at eight or nine, I've got those one or two open positions I'm still looking to fill in November of 2022. So I just don't know how the Fed is going to solve that problem as long as consumers are shifting their spending from things like e-commerce and home improvement into the local service economy and those small businesses are trying to catch up on unemployment. Well, the pushback would be that, again, what I just mentioned is that with these rate hikes that we've had, they really haven't worked their way through the economy. They're working their way through the housing market right now. We're seeing a lot of excess come out. So when you think about the potential for just slower economic growth with higher interest rates, with the value of housing coming in, the stock market being down 20 percent or so, I mean, sooner or later, you're going to have a cooling off. And, and I guess one of my big takeaways, Jeff, of Q3 earnings was just the absolute clarity that some of these massive employers, and again, this is 
45% of the U.S. workforce, not that 55% that you mentioned in the small, medium business, they are clearly laying people off, right? And so the combination, all of the above, is the thing that probably leads to some sort of economic uh, growth scenario that is probably suboptimal, it, it, you know, in 2023, you know, because we're coming limping into 2023. Yeah, the only thing I would say is, you know, for example, in the private tech market, most people did their layoffs in Q1 and Q2. So those, they are now hiring back. Even if you moderated hiring from doubling in 2021 to now you're only going to grow 5 or 10% this year, you're not net losing jobs in most private tech companies right now. You are for the ones that avoided Q1 and Q2, but a lot of the private tech market already, already did its, its layoffs. Now, if the economy gets worse... And, and corporate customers just stop buying software, for example, then yeah, I think you would see people trim, trim payrolls. But I, I just come back to that, you know, if you think about what are Americans using to spend with those small businesses, Americans still have a record level of savings, right? Because of all the stimulus, we pumped $9 trillion, I believe is the number of stimulus out into the economy, a record amount, more than 2X what we did in the great financial crisis. A lot of that capital is still sitting in the savings accounts and checking accounts of consumers. And so they may not do the you know hundred thousand dollar backyard remodel that they were doing in 2021, but they are going out and spending a hundred dollars for dinner uh, with that local main street restaurant. And I think as long as they do that and we don't see pain inflicted on small businesses, those small businesses are going to continue to hire and it's going to continue to be challenging for the Fed to to drive out of unemployment. We'll see about that. I mean, you, well, one of the things that we definitely have heard from some quick serve restaurants, they're seeing new customers. They're seeing them trade down a little bit. We heard that in the spring and summer from Walmart, for instance, saying they're yep. seeing a trade down. So again, I, I think that savings rate is is declining. Um, I think that consumer credit has been spiking. I think you know, val, you know, valuations of homes are coming in really hard at a time where the stock market is still down. You know, you know, twenty percent from its highs. So so again, all of this you know, combined with a little, you know, unemployment tick up, if we were to see unemployment tick up above 4%, again, you and I could sit here and debate the macro, neither one of us are economists, and we're, we're barely, um, you know, decent pundits as it, as it relates to <laughs> the tech markets. One thing I wanted to mention, well, let's though, not let's not forget, by the way, we've wiped out $9 trillion of wealth in the market. Yeah. Now, well, a lot that, of that's concentrated at the top, but yeah. I mean, $9 trillion is not an insignificant, an insignificant amount of wealth to wipe out. And that's yeah. a lot of 401ks. That's a lot of, that's a lot of investment equity that people have built up over the last decade that's been wiped out in the last 12 months. Yeah, no doubt about it. But then here's you and I look at these hammers on our wrist here. I, I saw what you were sporting here. This new eight hundred dollar Apple Ultra. Well, I mean, mine's about three versions ago. So oh, I'm, really? I'm still, I'm okay. still on the old version. Yeah. How, yeah. how have you not stepped up for this this bad boy? I mean, this I, is like I, the I'm Panerai. going to. I've heard it's great. I've heard it's great. In fact, I tell people my Apple Watch. They ask me why I wear an Apple Watch. I say it's the best way to avoid spending ten thousand dollars on a on a fancy watch. <laughs> that, that, that is that is a matter of fact. All right. Well, what were some bright spots? What were some like pretty decent takeaways that you have? I know you follow, um, you know, enterprise software pretty closely. Anything that, you know, any silver linings from some things that you heard from some companies kind of as they're thinking about, I know the visibility is poor pretty much across the board here, but any, any silver linings as we kind of get into 2023? Well, I'd say, you know, it's been interesting because I, I certainly do follow most of the software companies. Most have had pretty strong quarters. Some have have been a little lighter than the, on growth than uh, they were, say, a year ago. But almost everyone has given soft guidance. Nobody gets credit for being a hero. If everybody's saying we're going into recession and you're the CFO or CEO of a public software company and you say, we don't see any headwinds, people just think you're crazy. You're not going to get any credit for that. So almost everyone has lowered expectations for 2023, which, by the way, if that does not materialize and we end up in a soft landing, what you're going to see is those next 12 months estimates. So let's say I'm a software business is trading at, you know, for example, Datadog is trading at 12 times next 12 months estimated revenue. If, if I've lowered guidance and those estimates are based on that lowered guidance and I come in above that guidance, guess what's going to happen? Uh, unless multiples go down further, you're going to see outperformance in some of these names. So I think it really just depends on where we go f with the economy. And I, you know, like you said, I, I don't have a crystal ball there. You don't either. Yeah. But if we end up in a soft landing scenario, we have not seen a big pullback in spending in tech. I was here for you know the dot-com bubble. I was here for the great financial crisis. In 08, 09, we, see it, we saw a very quick pullback in spending. 
budgets got cut, contracts, you know, nobody closed anything for literally quarters at a time. We're not seeing that today. We're still seeing spending. I'd say it's varied. So like I mentioned, small business, SMB tech, we continue to see do well. So think of public companies like Square, Zendesk, Toast. Um, you just saw Shopify report a fairly good quarter. So we're still seeing strength in small business. We're still seeing incredible strength in cloud infrastructures. Think of the snowflakes, the data dogs, the confluence, et cetera. Um, I'd say the area where I have concerns is seat-based software. So that is both due to your point earlier about folks potentially doing layoffs. If you have fewer people, to, to you don't need to buy as much software. But also some of that seat-based software that people spent a lot of money on the last few years may not be driving as much productivity as they thought. And so, whereas you can't turn off cloud infrastructure because it literally is the, what you use to keep the lights on and run your business today. And if you're a small business, that software you're running today is, is basically the operating system for your business. So you can't turn it off. Some seat-based software, particularly in categories like sales and marketing, you know, or even some of the quote unquote productivity tools may be more of a nice to have in a recessionary environment. So TBD. Yeah, no. Uh, all right, let's go over the consumer side, though. I mean, like you just said, you, you've been through a couple of these huge downdraft cycles. When I look at the meta, which is obviously uh, the former Facebook here, down 72% of the year, down a little more from its all-time highs. I mean, obviously, we're, we're, we're coming on the anniversary of the name change and, and just the shift in focus and the spend on this thing that's that's you know they've, they've uh, literally named themselves after the metaverse. And you and I have talked about this over the course of this year, there's not a metaverse. We don't probably subscribe to what Zuck's view of the future is as it relates to all this. But, you know, like to see a company like this have its stock, you know, just crater over such a short period of time, this was going to be a trillion dollar market cap company, you know, that really does have a monopoly and a handful of businesses where they play. They have three billion monthly active users, 2 billion daily active users. I mean, I got to think that they're going to figure out how to monetize them in ways that they have not done in the past. You know what I mean? As they're seeing, you know, like the, the blue page or whatever, just kind of go away. Is this company totally broken or does it kind of intrigue you at this point with sentiment so bad with the spend at a level where they've doubled down for all intents and purposes, right? And again, we just don't know how they're going to get back to that level of profitability and the monetization of those users. And, you know, they haven't lost users yet, but they have the potential. And when you think about where the bulk of their advertisers come from, it's not these big, you know, like uh, CPG companies, right? It, it's a lot of small business, which might play into some of the, the things that you have to say about the underlying silver linings, I guess, or strength of our economy, if it really is going to be buoyed by small, medium businesses. Well, I think you probably saw the letter that, that Brad Gerstner published and sent to uh, Brad Gerstner, who runs Altimeter Capital and, and owns, I think he owns, I think he said he owns $350 million worth of Facebook stock. So he's not just a disinterested party. He's somebody who has a vested interest. And I think if I, I I'll, I'm not, I don't own the stock. Uh, I haven't owned it for a long time. I, I brilliantly bought it when it dipped after the IPO and when it doubled, I sold it. <laughs> so uh, second time I did that, I did that when I was a kid with Microsoft as well. So, um, but Brad had a really interesting point. I, I think, and I'm going to paraphrase a bit here. He said, if Facebook just went back to its headcount levels of 2020, it would generate a tremendous amount of cash flow, additional cash flow. And I think that it's sort of an open secret in Silicon Valley that most tech companies overhired in 20 and 21, certainly in 21. Um, you know, the, the, the famous show Silicon Valley, where the guy sits on the roof and gets paid. <laughs> Work from home created a lot of those folks in tech. And, you know, Facebook, Google, I'm sure even Apple and some of the other large companies have, have a lot of folks that are probably not putting in eight-hour days. So I think Brad's got a great point. I think the question you have to ask yourself on Facebook is, do I believe in his vision? And again, I think that Chamath made this anal analogy on their, their podcast. He's spending more than Apple spent to, to develop the iPhone. He's spending orders of magnitude more than Google did to buy YouTube. Like if you look at the big product bets in history, they were single billion dollar, single digit billion dollar bets. This is a bet that is tens of billions of dollars at least uh, and could be hundreds of billions. And so 
if he's right, it will go down as one of the historic bets of all time. And if you're a believer in the metaverse and all the things that come along with that, and I would argue the metaverse is, you know, it's more than the VR headset, it's gaming, it's probably digital payments, it's probably something tied into NFTs and creative and music and a whole bunch of other categories. But in its current format, I tweeted out last week, I could have saved Facebook shoulders a lot of money. I bought my son an Oculus. He used it for about a week and it's been in the closet ever since. It's just the form factor today is not it's not a viable form factor. And he plays a lot of Minecraft, a lot of Roblox. So if he's right, it'll go down as one of the historic bets of all time. It'll be a 10x from here. I just don't know. You know, We don't see a lot of the signs of that today. And obviously, we can wind back the clock and look at the bet that Jeff Bezos made on, you know, on AWS and Kindle and some other things that he did. The only difference I would argue is the, the gratification on AWS was instant. The uptake in the developer community was instant. It was consistent. It you know, it was growing year over year, and you could see that it was something that the market was demanding. It wasn't a push by Amazon. And, and so I, I think the thing you have to ask yourself today, is there a pull for these metaverse products or is it a push? And it's just years and years and years ahead of real adoption. Uh, again, I'm not, I'm not, I don't own the stock. I don't, you know, other than Instagram, I, I just don't, I don't use Facebook. I got off it a few years ago because I got really tired of all the political ranting and raving and during the election cycle, and I just couldn't bring myself to do it anymore. But um, it's an interesting, you know, I, I love, one of the reasons I love the technology industry, and one of the, one of the reasons I love companies that, have found, that are founder-led is founders can make these big bets, right? SpaceX today is not SpaceX if, if Elon can't make the kind of bets that he made. And I'm sure Zuck is telling people in the boardroom, hey, we're going to be an iconic company because of this bet. And as a shareholder, you just have to make a, an educated guess as to whether he's right or not. Yeah, and and listen, investors are, are voting with their wallets right now. Again, the stock's down seventy two percent. You know, I, I just bought some stock just below a hundred. I'm probably continue to kind of average in here. And you know, again, if you think we're kind of getting towards the end of this market cycle, especially with some of these names that are down, you know, you know, three x that of of the indices. Um, to me, I just think that let, let's make a bet on Mark Zuckerberg that he's got a second act that he's not MySpace. That doesn't seem like a too difficult one for me. I don't uh, think he's MySpace, here. but I think it's. it's it's a, you know, it's a cost. I mean, you could put that capital somewhere else. If you asked me, am I more bullish on Facebook over the next five years or the cloud infrastructure names like, you know, GitLab, HashiCorp, Snowflake, Confluent, I'll take the, I'll take the cloud infra names at these prices all day long. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say that like this stock trading at you know twelve times earnings with the kind of you know moats that they have right now. And but and, is he and, going to is he going to cut headcount? Is he going to increase yeah, free cash flow? Is he well, going to do buybacks? Is he going to do dividends? Jeff, I, I I I assure you that he will. There there will come a time in the not so distant future where headcount will come up and the stock will be trading back at one hundred thirty dollars. I mean, like. Like, like, like to me, like that, that's my bet right now. And, and, and again, you know what I mean? You can, yes, he's got the super, super value. You can do whatever the hell he wants, but sooner or later, he's not going to, to kind of like this stock just careening lower here. You know what I mean? So it'll find a bottom probably at some point in Q4. That's my take here. Um, uh, you know, but listen, you and I live through, you know, 2000, 2001, 2002. And let me tell you something, 2002 felt really bad. It felt a lot worse than 01 if you were long a bunch of these tech stocks and you still believed in the long-term vision. But to me, I, you know, again, I, I think that this one has the potential to have a sort of V bottom at some point in Q4. Um, let, let's the, the, let me do, let me just yeah. throw one thing out yeah. though. The difference in 2002, and I was a founder at that time, I had started a company in 97, essentially blew up in the dot-com bubble. I started my second company in 2003. The difference in that time period, the, the downturn was I mean, you go back to 19, October of 99, this is one of my favorite stats, October of 1999, there was 400 public internet stocks tracked by Morgan Stanley. The combined revenue was $15 billion. That's not, that's not even an AWS quarter. So the market at that time, it wasn't a given that the market demand for cloud infrastructure, software, mobile, I mean, the iPhone hadn't even been invented yet. So as a founder at that time, you were really wandering in the wilderness, making a huge forward bet on an unknown. Whereas today, as a founder, you're, you're making a bet that the market will come back to reward risk. Right now, it's just risk off, right? Everybody and their brother took money out of the market, put it into T-bills, muni bonds, wherever they're putting it to get yield. But at some point as a founder today, you're making a bet that the market will go back to placing a premium on risk and and value these companies more highly than they are today. But the end market demand is there. We didn't know that in 2002. 
Yeah. You know what the guarantee for that bet, though, also, Jeff, is that at some point in 2023, interest rates are going to start coming down. And then that's when that risk, you know, th- that's when that risk premium like kind of changes. So to me, again, you and I are both drawing from some different experiences that we've had over the last 25 years. I suspect that uh, history will be rhyming, if not repeating. Hey, Dan. What up, guy? You're into this fintech. What's all this I'm hearing about Current? You're going to like this guy. Current is a fintech company that's completely disrupting traditional banking. Wait a second. Does that mean I don't have to drive to the bank anymore? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I'm a new Current customer, and I manage all of my finances from one easy-to-use app. Well, I got to get this app, but where can I learn more? It's super easy. Just go to Current.com slash OK, O-K-A-Y, and download the app. That's Current.com slash OK. Current is a financial technology company, not a bank. Banking services provided by and Visa debit card issued by Choice Financial Group, member FDIC, pursuant to a license from Visa USA Inc. and can be used everywhere Visa debit cards are accepted. Hey, it's Dan here. I'm excited to tell you about a $1 billion app that's disrupting the way people like you and me invest. It's called Masterworks. They offer investors access to an estimated $1.7 trillion alternative asset that was once only accessible by the ultra-wealthy. I'm talking about blue chip art. Blue chip art has seen price appreciation that's outpaced the S&P 500 by 164% from 1995 to 2021. And the Wall Street Journal recently called it among the hottest markets on earth. It's no wonder the ultra rich like Jeff Bezos recently sold tons of Amazon stock and bought more art. And now you can too with the art investment app called masterworks.io. Join over 300,000 members for free on masterworks.io. Just go to masterworks.art slash OK computer, O-K-A-Y. That's masterworks.art slash OK computer. See important disclosures at masterworks.io slash disclaimer. Taboola uses AI to power recommendations for many of the world's top publishers and cell phone manufacturers. You know Taboola if you ever went to websites like CNBC or USA Today. When you finish reading an article, it's that tricked out recommendation engine pointing you towards additional content you will like. They also help brands reach over 500 million daily users, which makes them a compelling alternative to Facebook and Google ad platforms. Taboola has long-term exclusive partnerships with publishers, which means they help people like you and me discover content outside of social media. Taboola is a founder-led company that is traded as TBLA on the NASDAQ. Find out more about their mission at taboola.com. Here's an area where um, I know Jack shit about, but let's talk about, you know, private (laughs) funding in the tech market. There was a quote in the New York Times article in the week uh, quoting uh, Crunchbase that in Q3, private tech funding was about $81 billion, down 53% year over year. Um, What's going on? Is is it just that the, um, is it valuations? Is it like, you know, a lot of companies just kind of being hesitant to do down rounds? Like what's kind of your general take, you know, that you saw in Q3? I I suspect it's likely to continue to play out that way into Q4. But as you and I have talked about a lot, there was a lot of capital raised, right, um, in the VC landscape, you know, um, late last year, early this year that needs to be deployed. Yeah, I, I, we have been having this conversation a lot with our LPs as well as with our founders to kind of ex- try to explain what's going on in the market. And, you know, I'm, we're in the middle of it. Um, I, I wouldn't call myself an expert, but we are in the middle of it. And here, here's my take. In, Q1 of this year, you still had people doing financings that were at the tail end of last year's valuation. So there was still a bit of a frothy market. That then created sort of an artificial belief that the VC market was still red hot in Q1 when I think it was already cooling considerably. Q2, public market valuations settle in. People realize, okay, wait a minute, we can't pay 50 times ARR for these growth stage private companies that are going to go public at six times ARR. In Q3, you really saw that hit home. And so I just think we're still in the early days. We're probably in the second or third inning of the valuation reset in private markets. I will tell you in our own, in, you know, in my own universe, um, I didn't make a single new investment in a new company in the first nine months of this year. Now, I did several follow-on investments, but um, we didn't make a single new investment because there was just this huge valuation mismatch. I mean, literally companies coming in with four or five million of ARR wanting $450, $500 million valuations. And I'm trying to explain to them that their public comp at $300 million of ARR is trading at $1.2 billion. So we just have had a big disconnect in the market, and it normally takes a while to work itself through. 
it has now worked itself through. And a lot of these companies that raised in, in the summer of 2021 now need to raise capital because they have less than 12 months of, of runway. And so we're starting to see some really attractive opportunities. And I think you'll see, I think you'll see more financings get done in Q4 and Q1. All, all we're going back to is 2019, which was a quote unquote normal era. If you just look at the spike in valuations, um, in fact, I've got a chart right in front of me. You know, back in um, 2018, the average high growth software, so the top 10, top five high growth software companies were trading at about 15 times next 12 months revenue. Just to give you a, a sense of how crazy that got, in late 21, it was 65 times next 12 months for the top five software companies. Those are down now to 16. So we went from, you know, literally 15 to 65 down to 16. So we're, we're kind of getting back into a normalized territory. And I think you'll, you're going to see a lot more financing to get done. The other thing we've been sharing with folks is it's a phenomenal time to be a growth stage founder because the public market is now telling you exactly what you have to build. Whereas last year, the market was so distorted, it was really hard. If you were running a 40 or $50 million software business, it was really hard to try and figure out like, what should I be building? Should I be building a go for broke, grow at 100% a year, burn a $100 million business? Because that's what it looks like the market is rewarding. Or should I be building a business that's capital efficient and could be profitable when it goes public? And the example I always give folks is Viva. Viva is a vertical software business in the farm industry, terrific company. It raised $8 million of venture capital prior to going public and went public as a profitable software company. It can be done. And that company today is worth well over $10 billion. So I think we're just going to go back to a mode where the, the playbook for founders is much more clear than it was in 2021. And if you're running a 25 to $75 million business today, you get to reset the operating model for your company, recruit in the kind of executives that want to help you build that company and build a company that can go public in two or three years. And I think it's going to be a very attractive IPO market for those folks in 24 and 25. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, all right, let's talk about lastly, before we get out of here, now the new most infamous private tech company. It, it's called Twitter. It's still called Twitter. Um, Elon Musk, the, the, the CEO of Tesla, personally, took the company private, $44 billion, eight and a half times its expected 2022 sales. Um, this is a company that obviously did not monetize their user base nearly as well as some of their um, faster growing competitors over the years. You, know, you and I don't have to get into the, you know, whether you know, it makes sense or not. Uh, you know, from a financial standpoint, uh, I think you and I would look at many of the public comps and say it does not. I, I read this today, though, that Jack Dorsey, obviously the founder of the company, he rolled his 2.5% stake in the company worth a billion dollars into the Musk-led deal. He gave his equity in there. Wouldn't you have done the exact opposite, man, and just kind of closed the door on this whole chapter? It's been public for 10 years. It went public in November of, of 2012. Um, the stock is basically up 100% from those levels here. But let's be clear, if there was no myth, uh, there was no Musk bid for this company, the stock would literally, it'd probably be, I don't know, a $20 billion enterprise value at best. So he paid $44 billion. I just think it's pretty fascinating that guys like Dorsey roll their equity into this deal and hoping to think that they can make a return at some point when it comes back public in two to three or four years? Well, a, a couple thoughts. One, I tweeted out this morning, I thought Anthony Noto had a great quote this morning on CNBC. He was talking with Carl Quintanilla and he said, Twitter for the first time in history has the right governance structure. And if you followed the history of Twitter, it has always been a company that had a little bit of management by committee. Even when Jack was CEO on the Dick Costello, it had a very strong board, never really had that sort of founder authority to just make bold bets and, and frankly be wrong some of the time. And so I, I thought that was a really interesting insight from him. Uh, and he said, I'm bullish. I think it can be worth hundreds of billions of dollars because it's got a huge, you know, it has the best content on the internet. I wouldn't use Jack as a proxy because Jack, let's not forget, Jack's ownership stake in Square is worth several billion dollars as well. So he, he's, his, um, you know, whether his his family can eat is probably not riding on his, his stake in Twitter. But I think, look, I, I think Elon is arguably the greatest founder entrepreneur of our generation, right? He created SpaceX against all odds. He did things the government wasn't able to do with hundreds of billions of dollars in funding. He created the world's greatest car company and, and probably will lead the world in self-driving cars when that becomes a reality as well. So I personally think he's going to do some very exciting things with Twitter. 
I think he's taking on a lot of social risk. It's a very challenging platform to own or even be part of as an executive, just given everything going on in our social universe with politics, et cetera. But I think from a product innovation standpoint, it will be a way better product 12 months from now than it is today. That would be my bet. And whether he can monetize that at a higher rate, TBD, uh, I've seen a lot of speculation that he'll go into payments, he'll go into e-commerce. There's a lot of variations of Twitter that you could see being very popular to drive more monetization. But I'm pretty confident the product will be better in 12 months. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I'm just going to, you know, I, I respect you as an investor, as a, as a mind. You're going to take I mean, the other side of that. No, I, I just disagree <laughs> with a lot of what you said. I mean, I disagree that Tesla is the best car company in the world. I, I, you know, I disagree that he's some genius, you know, um, as it relates to SpaceX. I know they're doing amazing things. I know I sound like such a jackass saying that, but um, he did things that NASA couldn't do. Well, he did it with a lot of, you know, funding from the government. I, I'm just saying, like, to be honest with you, every single one of those companies without government subsidies was about to be out of business. I mean, but look know, at what, where, but look at where Ford, GM, Porsche, Audi, Mercedes are with EVs. They're literally a decade behind him. And Maybe. they all don't. Let's not forget, they all got bailed out in the great financial crisis. Doesn't it's not like GM hasn't had any federal support. Ford didn't actually, but Ford I mean, didn't. But but again, you know, Tesla was also born in you know 2010 as a publicly traded company in a zero interest rate environment. And you know, again, we just spent a lot of time talking about the risk taking that existed there. And you can talk about all those companies that you just mentioned, and you put all their market caps together. And I get it, Tesla's is worth it's lost more in market cap in the last year than all of those are worth. Okay, <laughs> like to be very honest with you, yeah. but I just think I've seen a lot of those offerings. I've had one. Of those offerings from Ford, I've seen the poor stuff. I just think it's all coming, and I just think I can't they, wait for the F one fifty Lightning. I think it's going to be awesome. Yeah, but I, but I also think that we're also seeing the the undoing of Elon Musk, and I know that sounds kind of bombastic or whatever. I just don't think that this guy can be the CEO of those three really important companies, and they are important. I get it, okay, and do a great job with all of them. I don't think Twitter's product is going to be a better product. I don't think it's going to be a bigger platform than it is. Um, you know, in a year from now than it is right now. So again, I mean, and I don't, I don't have any positions in, in any of this stuff right now. I'm not short SpaceX. I can't be short SpaceX. I know he's been selling SpaceX. I'm not short Tesla. I know he's been shell, selling Tesla, right? Um, uh, he just took, he sold a lot of Tesla to buy Twitter at a valuation that makes absolutely no sense in, in any way, shape, or form. So well, that, to, you, nobody can argue with that. The, the valuation is clearly probably what a 2X premium on, on, where he could have bought it if it if he hadn't put and it. And I also dead. think Jeff that 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 a lot of people in Silicon Valley have very rose color um, you know glasses as they think about him. And I think he's a very dangerous guy. I think that like some of the stuff that I see him pushing um, you know misinformation on the platform that he owns that has no advisory board. I agree um, with anymore. that anymore. And I think the way that he talks to the former president of um, Russia, the way he actually supposedly talks to Putin, the way he thinks that not only is he not a rocket scientist, he's not a political scientist and he's trying to you know kind of he's pushing out you know kremlin talking points here he cozies up to the most authoritarian government in the world which is china so he can make and sell electric vehicles uh over there when you know he doesn't even have a prayer of being number one two or three in market share over there so to me i think he's a very conflicted sort i don't think he's the genius that everyone thinks he is and i think we're going to see the unwinding of him that's my personal take do you here, think but he'll make money on on this bet on twitter no, not a chance in hell. And I actually think that, you know, again, all his equity guys are going to lose money. I think the banks are already losing money on the debt. I don't think he has a chance of really improving the, the, the product. If SpaceX first manned uh, spaceship to wherever the hell it's going blows up and, um, you know, and I'm not wishing that. I'm just saying, no. you know what I mean? And Tesla's market share declines meaningfully, which it is doing in places like China. It's gone from 25 percent to 15 percent. I know off a very low base. But if that were to happen in Europe, here, here in the U.S., I just think that this empire that he has is not likely to kind of you know be the thing in 10 years that it was in 2021 so again there's a shit ton of hubris there's a lot of you know kind of faith put in this guy that i think is 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 probably unfounded in my personal opinion well i think look it's an experiment we've never seen before i don't think has there ever been a single individual who's bought a company this large that wasn't a private equity firm that deployed you know tons of resources i i i can't think of any so it's a very interesting experiment I, I don't disagree with all your points about 
him on a personal level and the social issues. The thing I guess I would share is one thing that you learn in our business, the, the venture capital business, is that outlier people create outlier returns. <clears throat> and we t- we ha- I have an exceptional founder that I work with, and I often say to our team, if he was running company X, that company is probably worth 100 times more than it is today. And everybody says, oh, of course. There is such a wide delta between the exceptional founder CEOs and the not exceptional founder CEOs. He's clearly at the very top of that pyramid. He has his his, his issues, but uh, he has a very unique ability to have a vision for where a product and a company should go and drive people in a in a very ruthless way towards that. I mean, I you know, you talk to people that work at Tesla who would you know have meetings at three in the morning. I'm not saying it's a great place to work, but he is exceptional at driving. Uh, a, a, a driving outcomes. The the point you make about being CEO of three companies, we've also never seen. I mean, have well, we ever I seen mean, that? listen, Jack tried to do it with Square and Twitter and it didn't work particularly well here. So again, I mean, listen, I, I you know, again, you, you're much closer to all of this um, than I have. I'll just tell you my 25 years, I've never seen a meme CEO or a meme stock or a meme company. I've never seen it kind of make itself into the next cycle. I suspect we won't see it here. I suspect that we just kind of hit peak Musk. Um, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not rooting against him as an individual. You know what I mean? But I just think that all of the kind of um, excitement and exuberance around him and everything that he touches is not particularly natural. So to me, you know, I wouldn't be betting. Um, I wouldn't be betting for it, I guess, in, in, in at this stage of the game. Well, it feels like to me, most people are betting against it. I mean, most people are skeptical of his ability to pull this off, aside from, as you mentioned, the folks that put equity into the deal. You've got Sequoia Capital and Dreesen Horowitz, you know, folks like Ken Griffin at Citadel and Larry Ellison. Well, you say that, but, you know, Tesla is still a $722 billion market cap company that's down 35% on the year. And and again, you know, that's down just a little bit more than the NASDAQ. So, you know, the way I think about it is, is that, you know, you throw Twitter in there. I mean, fine, SpaceX, you could value that at whatever you want. I mean, the TAM is, you know, it's it's infinite, right? Like if that is is a well, why why wouldn't he go and spend a lot of time with SpaceX? Less time in a, a commoditized business that is Tesla. Less time in just I, I don't believe that he cares about humanity. I don't care that he's doing this for the public good or whatever. Like go do something meaningful. That's my take. But who am I to suggest that? Well, listen, <laughs> Jeff Richards, I always appreciate you coming on OK Computer. I, I love your take on the private markets, on the public markets, and of course. Um, Elon Musk and I, and I love going back and forth with your stuff. So thanks. Thanks a lot. Man. All right, man. Great to see you. It. Thanks for having me on. Thanks again to our presenting sponsor current and our supporters masterworks and tabula for bringing you this episode of OK Computer. If you like what you heard, make sure you hit follow and leave us a review. It helps people find our show. And we want to hear from you. Email us at contact at riskreversal.com. Follow and connect with us on Twitter at OK Computer Pod. We'll see you next time.